good afternoon. If everyone wants to settle in, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Kelly Gurka. For those of you who don't know me, I'm an assistant professor of epidemiology in the School of Public Health. I'm also the assistant director for education and training at the WVU Injury Control Research Center. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this month's Public Health Dialogues, co-sponsored by Workforce Development and the School of Public Health and the WVU Injury Control Research Center. I would first like to thank Kathy Hess, Crystal Rhodes, Bonnie Grimm, and Dave Filater for the assistance that they've provided in helping to put this together today. Um, and I'm sure I've missed some others that I'm unaware of um, as well. Um, I want to introduce you to our distinguished guest today, uh, Mr. Fred uh, Brayson. He's the president and CEO of Project Lazarus, which is a community-based opioid poisoning prevention model that also presents responsible pain management and promotes substance use treatment and support services. Project Lazarus is based in North Carolina and serves various parts of the U.S., including military and tribal groups. Mr. Brayson is a member of the National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators, the American Public Health Association, and the North Carolina Public Health Association, and he serves on the advisory board for the North Carolina Controlled Substance Reporting System, which is the PDMP, the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program in the state of North Carolina. He has served on the FDA Scientific Workshop Committees for the role of naloxone in opioid overdose fatality prevention and assessment of analgesic treatment of chronic pain. He's co-chaired the expert committee for the publication of the SAMHSA Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit, and he's helped create the ASTO strategic map for reducing overdoses in the U.S. Mr. Brayson has collaborated extensively with academic institutions such as Wake Forest and UNC Chapel Hill, as well as local, state, and national public health agencies. Mr. Brayson received the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Community Health Leader Award in 2012 and has been inducted into their alumni network. So without further ado, Mr. Fred Brayson. <clears throat> Thank you, Kelly, and, and, and thank you all. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to, to, to share with you today. And I say share because I like dialogue and, um, and your participation in what I'm talking about today. Um, but I'm, I'm just thrilled to have, again, that opportunity uh, to discuss the prescription medication issues, heroin, uh, and, and the public health perspective that we developed over time in, in North Carolina to address the issue. Uh, and as Kelly mentioned in what she was sharing, the, you know, the three premises that we, we began with uh, was obviously to prevent the deaths that were occurring in our own local community, and I'll describe that you know, in a moment. Uh, but we wanted to make sure that as we start to address an issue that we find in a community that we don't create further other problems or just push the problem someplace else by trying to fix what we are encountering. So we wanted to make sure we prevented the deaths, but we also wanted to make sure that you know, the individual who does need a prescription medication of a controlled substance does have acute or chronic pain issues that they can receive and have available to them the access to care, the medication, the treatment that is warranted for what um, they, they, uh, they have and what they have to deal with. Um, but at the same time, we all are aware of, you know, what has occurred with prescription medications and heroin and how others have developed issues of dependence, addiction, substance use disorder surrounding those. And if we suddenly make some changes and we create boundaries and we you know, make it less accessible for the supply, what happens to the individuals that already have an issue and we want to make sure as a community that we have a safety net for them and not just creating other problems or pushing them into other, other drugs or, or other areas. So that was kind of the balanced approach that we wanted to do from the very beginning. And th thankfully, I think we've been somewhat successful you know, in, in doing that. But this all started back in, in, for us anyway, for myself, back in 2004. Uh, and at that time in Wilkes County, North Carolina, uh, which is here, that's where we sit, uh, sort of the western side of the state, beginning in the Appalachian area. Um, the actual top of our county is the Blue Ridge Parkway. Uh, very large landmass, but, uh, you know, only 69,000 people. But as we were looking at the issues and, and trying to determine, you know, what was going on, I was the hospice director for our county program. And as a hospice director, I was in many homes, many families, you know, entrenched in the community. But I started to have actual prescribers in our community calling me up and saying, I can no longer safely write a prescription to that patient in that household 
because of the medication that's disappearing. And it wasn't just one patient, it was one, it was two, it was three, it was four, to where, you know, we were having nursing visits every day. You know, it was, you know, not cost effective, obviously. We had family members trying to hide meds every day from other family members. We were locking them up. Um, we had patients, we had one that freely admitted that she was selling some of her meds through her family because she was trying to leave some money for her kids. You know, so it was all those kind of issues that were suddenly in my face that I had never, ever experienced before. Yes, I had, you know, and being in home health and hospice for, for decades, you'd seen little smatterings of, of issues here and there, but nothing to this magnitude. So I started to ask questions, and I think as we all know, as you begin to ask questions and there's no answers, that big black hole gets bigger and bigger, you find yourself in it trying to climb out. And that, that's essentially how this began and, and, and what developed from that. Um, but just to give you some idea of what Wilkes is like, we are known in, in many circles as the moonshine capital. Um, Junior Johnson, you know, pretty much lived there his entire life. Now he's moved down towards Charlotte. Uh, we still have moonshine issues going on. Um, NASCAR basically started there. The first racetrack still sits there. Not used, but it still sits there. Um, we're primarily rural. It's chicken farming, cattle farming, haying, logging. The furniture and textiles pretty much have, have moved on. Um, Lowe's Corporation started there. Gardner Glass started there. Uh, we have a large Tyson chicken plant, um, but, you know, it's not the type of county that, you know, if you want to change your life or change things, you can't just move on to the other side of the county or change towns. Everybody knows everybody. You know, so, you know, the, we have the environmental factors, but then we also have the factors of the moonshine and the marijuana and methamphetamine and, and kind of a, you know, like an it's okay sort of mentality among some of the circles and, and being passed on from generation to generation. Uh, in, in Wilkes County. We, as, as, as we developed this, it was essentially just working as a task force in the community, but then we started to get other requests for outside the community and then, you know, pretty much determined that we needed to formulate something and we became Project Lazarus, but on the premise that we firmly believe that communities are responsible for their own health care. Nobody was going to come into Wilkes to take care of our problem. And especially in 2004, and inquiring to Raleigh, our state capital, inquiring of the feds in Washington, it was like, hey, we're having these prescription drug overdoses. We're having these problems. I was very surprised at the amount of response that was like, what problem are you talking about? You know, this was 10, 11 years ago. It was not on many radar screens of what we were specifically experiencing. So therefore, I wasn't getting any answers on how do we do something about this. Um, so we, we basically formulated our own way, you know, out of the problem. But as I learned about overdose, because it wasn't something that was common in my life, it was not something that I had experienced or had family members, and when anybody had mentioned overdose to me, I just thought of somebody on heroin somewhere. You know, that was pretty much my thought process and my experience, mainly from Hollywood movies, um, and not in my own personal life. But I realized from a public health perspective, it, it does fall under the injury section of the Division of Public Health. It is an accident. For most cases, it is someone who did something with a medication or a drug that was not, you know, that their body tolerance w could not handle what was ingested uh, or injected or snorted, however the, the, the venue was, and they, they died from an overdose because of the suppressed breathing. So it's an accidental poisoning, and it's tabulated just like we tabulate, you know, automobile accidents, somebody falls off a roof. It's an accidental situation, and anytime anybody talks to me about an accident, if it's an accident, then somehow or other, it's probably in some form or fashion preventable, or at least not to the place of, of causing death, and, and that's how we began to look at it. Well, early on in 2004 and five. I'm not a statistician, I'm not a data person, I'm not an epidemiologist, but I wanted to know what are we looking at, what are those numbers, and trying to find out who's got those numbers, who's willing to give them up, who's willing to collaborate with other organizations so we can look at the entire picture, was an event in and of itself in trying to do that, you know, from the state and local level. And most people couldn't give me the, re the, the ready answers that I needed. Um, but numbers are great, and I've learned to appreciate them, utilize them, and look at the, the data that needs to be looked at. But as a personal individual, I wanted to know more than that. Don't just give me 36 people died, 46 people died. Who are they? Give me a face. Give me a name. Give me something that I'm allowed to have so that I can look at the circumstances. And I began to ask this question. Of everyone who died, 
Who are they? What are they? When did it happen? How did it happen? Where did it happen? What are the circumstances surrounding it? What are we talking about as far as the medications or the drugs that were involved? What is the history? What are the situations? Because if I know more of that information rather than just the numbers, then perhaps I can do or we can do something to stop the next person from entering into that statistic that we don't want them to, the one of mortality. The first category that we found was patients simply misusing medications that they were legitimately prescribed for a valid reason. That they either, you know, with the pain relievers, they had more pain, so what? They took more medication than was necessary for that time, or not necessary, but appropriately prescribed. Or we have circumstances where they were receiving their pain medication from this doctor on this side of town over here, but they didn't want to talk about the benzodiazepine, the, the anti-anxiety behavioral medication that they were getting over here because of the stigma attached to that and what people would think. So therefore, they're on their benzodiazepine and they've gotten their oxycodone or something over here, and the combination of those factors take their risk level from overdose from here to here. You know, and we had patients simply because that information was not collected or known, unfortunately, dying from an overdose. Legitimate reasons, legitimate valid you know, purposes and diagnosis, but doing something incorrect with that medication um, causing uh, overdose. And then what goes on frequently in our communities is family and friends sharing to self-medicate. We're not talking about sharing to get high, sharing to divert and sell and make money. We're talking about simply that mom's got pain meds and Johnny's got some pain, so Johnny helps himself to mom's meds, but what was good for mom killed Johnny. We have that occurring in our communities. And they're just doing the best they can. You know, I don't want to have a doctor's visit. I don't want to copay. I simply, you know, are helping each other out by sharing medications. And, and I can tell you with the culture in Wilkes, and it's probably much like in West Virginia, one, we hoard things, we don't throw things out. If there's a shed in the yard, it's full. If the garage is full, it's whatever, because what, I might need it later, or somebody else might need it, or I can share it. Whatever the purpose is, we keep it. The same mentality, the same behavior, just translates over into medication too. That if I took five people, even strangers, put them in a circle and one said, you know, I'm really having an aching back today, one of the other four is going to say, I think I have something at home to take care of that. That's just being polite, but unfortunately being very dangerous because of the fact of what that is, what you have at home can kill. All right? And that's what the, the general public is now beginning to learn, but, you know, hasn't learned you know, fully, you know, at this point, that we're not talking about Excedrin or Tylenol. We're talking about very potent medications um, for specific reasons. So we have, we have had those occurrences in our community causing overdose. And then accidental ingestion. We're seeing in North Carolina the, the, some of the major emergency department visits are among toddlers who are ingesting medication that's found in the home because there's much more medication in our homes today than, ever, than there ever has been. Yeah, we, we know that there, there's, there's more being produced, there's more being prescribed, there's more being invented, you know, for, for the, the ailments that we have, which is great, but easily accessed. So we unfortunately have had um, young people in that category. And then we have the recreational user, <clears throat> somebody who is not dependent, doesn't have a substance use disorder, but you know, I've just had a very rough week, you know, and I just need to go out on the town for the weekend and have a good time to relax. I mean, that's very common. You know, and in, in, in everywhere in the United States, but unfortunately, like in Wilkes and other areas, yeah, the, 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 the alcohol is usually there, probably marijuana is there, but now somebody's got pills in their pocket. Somebody's got something that they put on the table and say, you know, this can really help you relax, or this will really help you, you know, in, 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 in trying to unwind. And, and unfortunately, because of the pressure or whatever, or the lack of knowledge, they help themselves. So again, we have had those individuals with no history of, of abuse, so to speak, that we would think of, but dying from an overdose because they simply took somebody else's medication. And we hear that most often in the news, especially among ecstasy and some of the, the events that go on uh, and other drugs. And then, of course, the fifth category is somebody who has been dependent, who has developed an issue with a substance use disorder addiction because of the medications that they've taken for whatever reason. And, and, and I can tell you the volumes that we talk about with this, because we've taken and worked with individuals ourselves, um, you know, one, one woman was 16 pills a day. You know, we've had another with 25, and then I was in a community recently where somebody who was in recovery basically could lay out, she was taking 45 pills a day. Now that is no longer to get high, that is only for to keep and maintain some normalcy, 
some, you know, not being in withdrawal, not being sick, but then how much energy, how much money, and how much is going into trying to find 16, 20, 25 pills a day because any, any prescriber is not going to be writing you that much unless, you know, it's an illegal situation. Um, so again, that up and down again, those changes in and out of treatment, not realizing tolerance level changes, those are all the different factors that roll into that risk level of, of causing an opioid poisoning, a controlled substance poisoning, and an overdose. So we as a community say, how do we reach all of these folks? How do we reach them so that they don't become that statistic? And we realize there isn't any one thing there we can do, but there's everything that we can do. Because we have to reach them at every age, every place in their life, for whatever reason, and every chain of, of connection that has to do with who they are, what they are, you know, regarding those ages. And that's sort of how we, we built what we did. Because we've learned in this pyramid from the Center for Disease Control that for every one overdose and death that we're talking about, there literally is 800 to 1,000 other people that could be. So again, we have to go beyond the numbers to, oh, we want to reduce the overdoses, and, 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 and that's where we get most of our attention is, oh, you dropped your overdoses that much. Yes, but what did we do behind the scenes to reach all of these folks? Again, from a community perspective, because it's 15, 26 in emergency departments, 115 who are abuse or dependent, and 733 non-medical users based on their studies. Well, who's a non-medical user? Most of our thought process is, oh, they're just abusing that medication. Not necessarily. If I had a hydrocodone back six months ago from a root canal and I take it today for a sprained ankle, that is a non-medical use of a controlled substance because it is not what it was prescribed for. And what happened to my body? What happened to my life? What is going on in the past six months to where it was good six months ago and now it's dangerous? <coughs> Excuse me. Those are the factors that help change all of this that from a public health perspective, if we can reach the individuals, the families, and so forth with that kind of education and understanding regarding medications, we can help reduce and, have, uh, and lessen the adverse events you know, from this. But how did we get here? And I use Earl and Edna to help you know, dr drive this message. And they're talking about it. They're sighing. And it's, OK, we've avoided it long enough. We're not getting any younger. I hoped it would just disappear. I know, but it's wishful thinking. We can't ignore the elephant in the room anymore. So where should we start? At the beginning to figure out the root cause of the problem, how did the elephant get in the room in the first place? How are we where we are today? <clears throat> that I am standing here before you on an issue that I've been addressing for 10 and 11 years, but that legally, United States of America, including West Virginia, is in legal epidemic status for prescription medication overdoses. How did we get here? When I started to raise the awareness with this, the first thing, and it's, it's just kind of our thought process and behavior, we want to blame somebody. We got to point the finger at somebody in order to get it off our shoulders and then say it's their fault. You fix it because it's your fault. Well, we can't do that. We can't point to the prescribers and say you're all over prescribing. We can't point to the pharmaceutical industry and say you, couldn't, you shouldn't create this medication. Well, tell that to the patient who needs it. I'm thankful that it's there. I've seen medication do wonderful things for folks and, and enhance their life and functionality in life. But at the same time, we can't blame law enforcement by saying, you're not arresting enough people. You know, it's, it's, it's those factors and more that we have to start to address in order to find out how did we get here. So if we look at the blame game, all right, how did we get here? Well, one of the first things is the public perception regarding medication. If it's written by a prescriber and it's in the house, it's OK, it's legal, and it's there available for anybody who essentially needs it. That's society. That's how we think for the most part. It's not cocaine. It's not heroin. It's not methamphetamine. But it's a prescription, and this is what it's good for. So therefore, I can take it even though it's moms or dads or brothers or sisters or friends. And in most communities, when I talk about that, I can use the example of Everybody at one time or another, <coughs> excuse me, has been on an antibiotic. Ten days. Most, after five days, hey, guess what? You feel pretty good. You know, I've tackled this one. What happened to the other five days of medication when you didn't feel the, complete the whole ten days? For most people, it's still sitting in the cabinet because they realize that that infection could come back or it could be some other infection or it could be utilized by somebody else in the family. That's the thought process and that's the behavior. And those are some of the things that have rolled us into this problem because of that thought process. And we know how readily available it is. It's covered by insurance. It's covered by Medicaid. It's covered by Medicare. It's easy to obtain. 
and it's easy to have, so it is readily available. And you know, I, I've dealt with some of our individual communities, and a family member will tell me, yeah, you know, my, some of my people in my family, they knew I was going to the dentist, they knew I was gonna have some oral surgery, they knew I was coming home with medications, and the day I get home, they're calling me up and saying, you know, hey, you got any this year? You know, those are the sum of the issues that we're dealing with at the local level. Because we have this mentality that prescription drugs are pretty much good for anything, you know, and, 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 and available. And this is, you know, it's no longer the, the pub after work. This is going on at work. You know, and those are, again, some of the, the, where we have to change. Because we've learned from the CDC and other studies that the diversion isn't going on in the back alley, though there's some of that. The diversion isn't going on by people going to other states to pill mills and so forth, though there's some of that. 70% of the diversion is happening right inside of our homes, in the workplace, in the schools, living room, bathroom, bedroom, of people just having and diverting medications that have been responsibly prescribed. 55%, it's from a friend or a relative, freely shared, and the other 15% that we're looking at is either bought or, or stolen from individual family members. And yeah, I talked to law enforcement. How can they police that? Well, they can't, unless they're sitting in everybody's homes. So that's a behavioral public health situation about how people practice with something that has been given to them legitimately or somebody else and what they do with it. And then, of course, we have lifestyle today. Everybody likes the easy button, okay, the fast and furious, let me get done with what I want to do and get on with what I need to do, and rather than... Uh, you know, taking a rest or eating well or, you know, all of those factors, I find that there's medication that I can manage my lifestyle and I can forget about health care. You know, I can, you know, I, there's something to take me up, so there's something to take me down, there's something to keep me going. There's all sorts of something out there and because of educating our public on what those medications are and, and what they can do, there's more thought process that, okay, you know, I'm, I'm really, you know, trying to do more than what I'm physically capable of, but there's something I can take to keep me physically going. You know, um, and so we have those issues uh, about you know, those behavior. But we also have in, 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 the, in the 90s, the Joint Accreditation Commission for Health Organizations, which are the ones that oversee and audit our hospitals and healthcare facilities, determined that pain should be assessed, pain should be treated, and it should be documented. I, I mean, that's not a bad thing. You know, then we had the Veterans Administration in 97 saying that we actually needed that fifth new vital sign. That when you go in for a wellness visit, you get your weight checked, which nobody likes. You get your blood pressure checked. You get your, you know, your, your pulse checked and so forth. But then they're going to ask you, are you in pain? That was something that came out of the Veterans Administration. That has become common practice, especially with JCO saying that pain should be assessed. So you ask the question, are you in pain? That's why we have those smileys or frowns in every emergency examining room. That came from that back in, in the 90s so that prescriber asks you, are you in pain? You say yes, next question, where is it? And then the next question we all know on a scale of one to 10, what is it? Well, for somebody who has an eight or a seven, that could be somebody else's three or a four. You know, how do you predetermine that? How do you determine that by what they're telling you I'd rather have it based on functionality. You know, is this pain causing you not to function? You know, and, and what level can we get you to in order that you can function? All of those, but that's a whole nother, whole nother talk. But all of these factors have played into this perfect storm because as you look at, you know, asking the question, are you in pain? Most medical schools in the United States have about eight to nine hours of education on chronic pain management in medical school. So here you have a whole prescribing community that is now asking the question, are you in pain? But they don't have an arsenal of ways to treat that pain other than writing a prescription. Not that that's a wrong thing to do, but we have to look at the whole picture. And when we have most who have not had all of the education, and especially in rural areas, that is all that's available. And I can tell you from my own community, if I'm talking to a dairy farmer, they've got to get up tomorrow. They've got to be available for those cows in the morning, and they can't go to another treatment or an, uh, or an invasive treatment. They just need to keep going, and what's going to keep them going with their pain? And that's a prescription. 
or somebody who's got the cattle or the chicken or whomever, you know, they just can't take off or they can't afford to be going or they don't have the transportation to get where they need to go. All of those are factors that have played into this perfect storm. So there's no single blaming area, but we have to look at the whole picture because as we look at all of this, then we, maybe we can start to reverse it in each of these categories that we're looking at. And as we did this, again, initially when we started to address the issue in our county, we did not have a template. We did not have a how-to. We just knew there was something wrong in our house and we needed to fix it. And people were dying. How do we do that? Well, about three years into this, Wake Forest came in and did a, a wonderful, well, I say wonderful evaluation because it came out well um, on, on what we did. But it, it helped us, you know, through all of that to realize what we did do and start to put a picture of this. You know, because, it, you know, this was, trust me, this was done on the fly. You know, we were just day by day, you know, trying to uh, address this. And I'll walk through this model with you uh, to describe, you know, what we were doing and how we did it. Because the first thing we had to do was raise public awareness. I'm a hospice director. I suddenly became aware in one day that I didn't know the day before. So I start to ask questions. Law enforcement says, yes, we're aware of a growing problem. Emergency department says, yes, we're aware of a growing problem. And everybody else in the community was like, what are you talking about? What do you mean prescription medications, prescription drugs? What's, what's the problem with those? You know, not fully aware of what was actually occurring in their own hometown and their own location. So we had to raise the public awareness. And I can tell you there's 15 to 16,000 people that die every year from a prescription medication overdose in the country. That resonates somewhat. But for local folks in a mountain community, it's like, unless they're personally affected, they aren't a clue. You know, they aren't in tune to what is going on. So that's when we started to pull the, the data together and say, I can tell you how many in your neighborhood died that shouldn't have because it was an accident. I can tell you how many prescriptions are, are in your community that could possibly get into the wrong hand. That resonates and that raises the awareness. Now, in 2004, if I took a room of this size and asked how many of you know somebody or are aware of somebody or have been involved with somebody that has an, an, uh, uh, an issue with prescription medications that is affecting their lives, 2004, just a few hands. Now, just about in every meeting that I go to, every hand goes up. Somebody knows somebody that knows somebody. And a public response to an issue normally does not become an effective action unless they're personally affected. That's just our behavior, unfortunately, but that's the reality uh, of the situation. So we had to raise awareness, and unfortunately, uh, after a two-year of, I call it rattling cages, knocking on every door that I could to talk about this, it took a negative to get a positive action. And that was, unfortunately, three overdoses in less than 48 hours. And that got on the front page, finally, of the local newspaper. And then everybody started talking, and then pointing fingers and blaming uh, but at least it, 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 it did prompt some action. And in that action and trying to rattle those cages and knock on the doors, if I start talking to a person that has no idea, not been affected, clueless as to what I'm talking about, their first thought is, why are you even telling me this? Why is it that I need to be involved in this? And that's how we started to develop, okay, how can I answer those questions? Because if you want me to be engaged, you better be able to tell me how I can be engaged and what I can do. So we developed these three, these three questions and answering them for our different community sectors. One, why am I needed? So that if I'm talking to the teacher or the pastor, I can answer that. Then I can provide to them, what do I need to know? That information, according to who they are, what they do in the community sector that they're involved in. And then the last one is what needs to be done. If I provide them that information, I have automatically given them an action plan even though they've never been engaged in it or even maybe you've never heard of it before. But even if I'm talking to a parent, why am I needed? Because you have medications at home and some of your kids or friends could possibly get their hands into it. So what action can they take? Lock it up. You know, it's that simple, but it changes a behavior that wasn't there before. You know, so that's the premise that we sort of built this on, but we did it community sector by community sector by community sector. Faith community, law enforcement, prescribing community, schools, um, civic organizations, human service organizations, our youth organizations, whomever, however, we got to them and started to help answer these questions and provide that information so that they could become engaged and do something about it. And as we did that, I did use data to, you know, drive it, you know, a, a lot of the information so that they had the reality. And, and our list of what we provide is much more extensive than this. 
I mean, I can literally right now for every county in North Carolina create a 30 to 35 slide set of graphs of information that is specific to that individual community. It has to do with mortality. It has to do with how many benzodiazepines have been prescribed, how many prescribers are prescribing that, how many opioids have been prescribed, and how many are prescribing that, how many emergency department visits, how many admitted to the hospital, how many adverse events, what are the ages. All of those factors now we can provide to the individual community so that they can do the right intervention and where it needs to be done and do that on a, as a real-time basis that we can. Uh, and then, of course, as, as Kelly talked about, the, the prescription drug monitoring program. How many are actually using it? How many are looking at the prescribing history of the patients that they're now prescribing to? So that they have that information, so that they would know that I'm prescribing you legitimately for a, a, a pain situation that you have, but now I found out you are getting this medication from the psychiatrist across town. You look at that information online, and then, okay, now I can do this safely, whereas prior to that, I couldn't. You know, those are the factors, and then who's using it? So we look at all that across the board, and you can see the overdoses in the United States, just to give you an idea. Unfortunately, your, your West Virginia is among the top, if not the top, on a consistent basis. Um, and even though some interventions and preventions have been, you know, uh, at least somewhat done, um, it, it's still there, unfortunately. And then we look at the opioid sales, and we know that treatment admissions and overdoses are correlated with that. Not necessarily a total causal situation, but correlated to determine, you know, why, how, and, you know, what do we need to look at to ensure the right person has it, the person that shouldn't doesn't, but the person who's in trouble has the help, but the person that has it is doing it safely and, and correctly. That's how we look at those uh, numbers. And, you know, these are all available from the Center for Disease Control, but about 46 people die daily. Healthcare providers have written enough prescriptions so that any one of us as an adult can have a 30-day supply for a month in the entire United States. Now, I'm not saying any of those prescriptions shouldn't have been written. I am not and will not get between a prescriber and a patient in an examining room. I don't want myself in there. I don't want the legislators and the states in there. I just want best practice between the two. That's it. The best practice, the best written prescription, and the best behavior from the patient or the family surrounding that patient. That's what makes an entire excellent difference in, in what we have been doing. Um, but again, that data helps give us the information on where we need to intervene. But as we looked at this in Wilkes County, and from a public health perspective, we have to look at each individual community. I don't, you know, I, I don't know your state as well as you do, but I can tell you in North Carolina, on the far west, I have the Cherokee County and I have the Cherokee Indian Reservation. And on the far east, I have Dare County and the Outer Banks and maybe some of you have been there. It's vacation land. It's a totally, they're like two different countries, two different cultures, two different lifestyles. I cannot do in one and do the same thing in the other and expect the same result. I have to examine the community to see what is the culture, what is the environment, what are the factors that are going on. If I look at Dare County in the east and it looks like, well, looking at your trends of overdoses and crime and, and, and so forth, you know, their vacation land, from May to October, it all goes down. But then starting in November, December, and January, when the money's not flowing, I'm laid off for the winter season, whatever, all of a sudden we start to things go back up again. You know, because of, of the times and the seasons and the situations in people's lives. You know, summertime is great, wintertime, nobody's around, you have more depression, you have more issues. You know, all of those factors play into it. So we dissect the counties. Every single one of these bubbles is a Wilkes County, is a, is a North Carolina county. The prescribing levels for opioid medications in the state is about 6% of 9.5 million people. That's a lot of people, that's a lot of prescriptions, that's a lot of doses that are out in the communities. The larger bubbles are more of our urban areas, our, our Mecklenburg, Charlotte area, Raleigh, Durham, Winston, Salem, and the smaller ones are our more remote, rural, small populated you know, counties that we have, and we have a good number of those. And you can see where Wilkes County is up top there, normally averaging about 8%, not the state average of 6%. So as we look at this and I go, okay, Wilkes County, one of the first things I might think of was, well, if it's at 8% and the state's at 6, we should be down to 6. That is an incorrect thought. I'm already assuming that I have more patients getting it than they actually need it. Well, not necessarily. I might have more people in my community that do need it. 
So we look at it as, okay, that's an at-risk county because there is the correlation between how much is prescribed and how much is out there, and we have overdoses and adverse events. So it's an at-risk county. What safety measures, what interventions, what monitoring and surveillance can we do to ensure the safety without disrupting the care? That's, how we, that's the premise that we've built this on. But from a public health perspective, again, we have to look at each individual county to see what's there, what's available, what is happening, and how do people live there, and what is their behaviors and, and, and practices. So as I look at the spokes of this, to give you an idea, community education, once we had awareness, that was first and foremost. Again, what's the community to do? What do I need to do as a parent, as a person? What can be done? We developed a tagline of prescription medication. One, you take it correctly, you store it securely, you dispose of it properly, and you never share. That is new to our communities. Take it correctly, oh no, I take it as needed. One of the most dangerous things you can do with a pain medication is take it as needed, because you don't know how much is building up in your body. You know, if, you know, if, if you're to, supposed to take it one every six hours or one every 12 hours, well, you don't take it every three. Yeah, I mean, those are the factors that we have to talk about. And then, of course, store securely, Oh, no way. It's got to be on the kitchen counter so I can remember to take it when I'm supposed to take it, or on the nightstand, or just behind the mirror in the, in the bathroom. All of the logical, unfortunately, open places that we have in our homes that we can no longer do and dispose of it properly, oh, no. Western North Carolina, West Virginia, no way. I paid for that. I'm keeping it. I might need it, or somebody else might need it. Those are the thought processes and the behaviors that drive that. And then, of course, never share. We've already covered that. Of course we share. We like to help people out. You know, that's what happens or is happening. And so we, we've developed a, a, a coalition leader manual and a community toolkit that has about 30 of those sector groups listed in there. And there's actual fact sheets. Again, why am I needed? What do I need to know? And what needs to be done? And educating each sector group on those factors and giving them that information because we're trying to change the individual. And every individual has a biological factor, a psychological, social, and spiritual. Good, bad, or ugly, depending upon any of our lives and our growing up years or whatever. You know, and everybody's different biologically. I can't stand pain medication. The very few times in my life that I've had to take it, I'd rather not, and I will endure the pain or find something else to get through whatever I need to get through. And there's other individuals, and I'll use my brother-in-law as an example. He had heart surgery. And about six months after that, you know, he came to, to visit, and we were talking, and he says, you know that morphine stuff? It's wonderful. Now, not that he developed a problem, but it made him feel really, really good. That's a biological difference. So based on him, is he at risk for a possible issue with that? Sure he is. More so than what I am, because I can't tolerate it just to take it. You know, so we have to look at those factors and then look at the environmental factors, the psychological factors in Wilkes County. We have a huge depression issue. Most of our involuntary commitments and suicide issues that present in the emergency department, fully over one third are because of depression. That's the first thing that they will talk about. You know, so all of those things drive, unfortunately, aberrant behaviors, but how do we change the individual? How many have children? Do they do 24-7, 100% of the time that you expect them to do? Never. No. If you could talk to my parents, they would say, Fred, no way. You know, of course not. So even when we live with somebody 24-7, 100% of the time, they still aren't going to do everything that we expect them to do. So we determined in order to do the changing, let's change the village. Because everybody from pretty much that five-year-old and beyond is being influenced outside the house. Good, bad, or ugly of that. And if we can change the influencers, then maybe we can reverse some of those other factors that got us into this. So we started to work at, look at well, what, what makes up our community. Well, we have schools, we have law enforcement, we have senior services, we have uh, human services, we have our faith groups, we have our medical groups, we have our youth groups, we have our treatment groups. Let's deal with them, each one as an individual grouping, and help them do best practice on the population that they serve by preparing and presenting messages and behavioral changes over and over. And I use the example of a seventh grader. Now, when I grew up, it was pain medication. Wasn't a drug, it was pain medicine. And I didn't touch medicine. 
drug was heroin, cocaine, speed, whatever was available at the time. That was over there. My thought process, it was medicine, and I didn't touch it. Well, as we started to look at changing the village, those were some of the things we found out. So a seventh grader, if they're hearing the message at home, that pres prescription medications, you don't, you take it correctly. If it's yours, keep it. If it's not, don't share it. If they hear it at school, if they hear it among their peers, if they hear it among their coaches, if they hear it in their youth group, if they hear it in their clubs, that's at least five, six, seven times that that seventh grader over and over again might start hearing the clear message surrounding that. We're not talking about don't just stand up there and say don't do drugs. We've tried that for 50 years and we're still doing drugs. Okay, we're talking about practice regarding what we are talking about prescription medications mainly. We know heroin's an issue and, and, and we'll talk about that somewhat. But changing the behaviors in the thought process. And I keep finding things that over and over that drive this home to me. I had a kindergartner teacher in one of our schools in Wilkes County come to me at a meeting and said, you know, really impacted me the other day when one of my five-year-old little girls in the class came in and said, you know, I really love my mommy when she's on her happy pill. What does that tell a five-year-old? Happiness comes from a pill. And you're not liked when you aren't happy, so medicine is what will create my happiness. Those are the things that we now have to undo in that process of what we're talking about, and the village is the best way to do that. Another example that recently happened personally is, like I told you, I never, I, I can't stand pain medications, but I never thought once of going into my parents' medicine cabinet. I mean, it wasn't a yes or no decision. It was not even a thought process to go look and take something that was in there. Just never entered my mind. I brought that up to some family members of mine and one happened to be my brother, and he's six years younger than I am. When I made that statement that I never, ever thought about that, he looked at me and says, but I did. And I said, you what? You know, and as an older brother, you want to do the old, you know, upside the head. You know, that never changes even over 50. But irregardless, he did it. And then he outed his sister, who's five years younger. They both did it. And I'm thinking, okay, same house, same parents, pretty much the same environment. They actually knew what was there, knew what it would do, and took it as a teenager. Thankfully, there was no issues that developed from that, but how in the same house did I never think about it, and in five to six years, they actually did it and knew what to do? Somebody in the village got to them. Somebody in their environment outside of that sphere got to them, and they learned that information. So if that's the negative, then the reverse is true. Positively, we can make a change. Now, I haven't talked to my sister about this yet, and I will when I see her face to face, because guess what she is today? A pharmacist. So, <laughs> so I've got something on her, um, and she can't deny it at this point. So that, that was the premise of what we decided to do. We can't reach the individuals one by one. We can't even ensure their change, but as a village, maybe we can start to make a difference with everybody doing the right message. And this is, uh, this, uh, I was presenting in a community, and this was the following email from the county health director. And I'll let you read it. I'm not going to read it to you. I'll give you a minute. A health director. We can't assume that even those that know that should know know exactly what we're talking about. Because this is common behavior. Not that everybody's got Cipro in their house, all right? But but the rest of that is fairly normal, everyday behavior in our communities and in our homes. So it's not, you know, it's not like this is being taught at every single level. It's a behavioral situation within our communities. So we are doing, and these are just some examples, we are working in our schools at every age level because of that five-year-old, okay? Because we have had high school students, unfortunately, overdose. You know, we have had situations at the community college. So we address it at every single level through activities, whatever's age appropriate, whatever behaviors we're talking about in order to do that. And, and unfortunately, in most of our community schools, and that's probably the situation here, how big are their budgets? <laughs> They're not. How much has been pulled back? Much. So any of the extras outside of classroom are pretty much other than sports and clubs are non-existent. 
So we, as a community, said, we can't lose what we've been trying to do there, so let's get grants and get somebody in there, and we as a community got that done. We pretty much have a full-time person in our schools just addressing these issues among the students. Prevention groups and working with problematic students, you know, and making a difference there, and, and I'll go through some of that. And this is RX abuse and death, they go hand in hand. Anybody that pretty much gets the message as long as they know what RX is. This was created by a group of seniors in our high school, one of our high schools. We gave them the task and said, all right, if you wanted to reach your peers with this message, what would you do? Design something that we can put into a flyer or a poster and create this. And this is what they created and designed themselves. And our first response was, wow, that's a little uh, harsh, isn't it? And they said, yes, it is. Meaning, this is, what we w this is what resonates with us. This is what we need to hear. Well, as they did this, one of the parents of one of the students found out on this project that they were doing, and then he came out and said, you know, I'm a local businessman. I've been here all my life, and I've never told anybody this, but I am personally in recovery for prescription medication addiction that I had developed after an injury. His daughter did not even know that. But he came out and said, I appreciate what these kids are doing. I need to know that I need to talk about this more. And I want to take this flyer and pay for it and make it a billboard. Then the chamber found out about it. And the chamber said, this is great. I want to get these students together. Let's put a red ribbon around it, have a ribbon cutting, take a picture and get it in the newspaper. And guess what they did? Front page. So here it was created by the community paid for by the community, and promoted by the community. And all we did was a catalyst to provide. This is the problem. Tell us what you need to have in your population group in order to make a difference. And they created this. Now they want to do another one this year. You know, and I'm sure they want to do another one next year. You know, but that's great. We want you to do that uh, because it does resonate. And this was up for months. The one on the left is take a seat, take a breath, take a moment to be thankful for life. When using prescription medications, you take it correctly, store it securely, dispose of it properly, and never share. That's a church bulletin insert. We have 300 churches in Wilkes County. Where am I going to find my people? Somewhere in church, for the most part. So we get those out a few times of the year to the churches, and on the reverse side, we give instructions on what you can do. You know, this is where you can get a lockbox. You should be locking up your medications and then listing what, you know, to dispose of it. If you're done with it, if it's old or expired, you can take it to law enforcement. They have a box over there. Just drop it in. Won't even ask a question. It is public health change where they are. They're not going to come to a meeting. You know how many parent meetings we've tried to do outside of everything else, and you might get five or six or a dozen? That's it doesn't happen. You have to go where they are in the context of who they are, where they are, and what they're doing, and that resonates to them over and over. You know, it's the same reason why we see the same three commercials inside of less than 30 minutes. It's to get the message across. We have to look at it the same way. Billboards doing the same thing. Prevent the problem. Don't be the problem. Lock medications up. Because remember, we're looking at five categories of death and mortality. We aren't just talking about somebody who has an addiction, substance use disorder. We're talking about people who have no intention of doing anything wrong, but it's happening. How do we change that? By behavior change. But we also had to address, as everybody's aware, the prescribing community. Where are the prescriptions coming from? From the prescribing community. So as we began to look at this in Wilkes County, we partnered with our Medicaid folks and developed a chronic pain initiative pilot just in Wilkes County. That brought the entire community work that they were doing in with the prescribing medical network and married the two together. So we developed a, a prescriber's toolkit on managing chronic pain, on appropriate prescribing, how to assess, how to treat, and you know what? How to refer. If you find a patient with an issue and with a problem, do you even know what to do with them rather than just firing them for your practice? That doesn't solve the problem. It just moves it out of your camp into somebody else's. So those are the informations that we provided to them so that they could do best practice and be integrated in the network in the community that if they found somebody with a dental issue or a behavioral issue or a substance use issue, they knew who they could do the warm handoff and refer them to and not just get rid of them as a patient within that practice. All of those factors played a part you know, in doing that. And now that, that toolkit is, is being presented across the entire state. And it's actually been written better now than it was when we did it locally 
and, and I'm even now looking at it for a third time. And then the emergency department in our community was known as a very easy place to get something. You know, they're geared to treat, you know, and somebody coming in, you know, with the bad tooth or the migraine or the lower back or whatever that's very hard to really diagnose, but if all the actions and the behaviors are there surrounding pain, you're going to get a prescription. Well, in 2004 and 5, in our little community, we didn't have an all-night pharmacy. So at 11 o'clock on a Friday night, guess who got busy? The emergency department, because anybody going in knew that they were going to get something in their hand. So as we started to develop that, we first started with guidelines back in 2006 on what can we do to address the population that is having this behavior. It developed into an administrative policy that was fully developed in 2007 and 8, and it, we put it in the form of a toolkit. One, we embedded a case manager in the emergency department. Hospital agreed they would cover 50% of the salary. Medicaid agreed that they would cover the other 50%, so that everybody's sharing in what we're trying to do. And that person's responsibility was to follow the high utilizers, follow the frequent flyers for whatever issue. Make sure that they're not using the emergency department as their primary care. Make sure that if it's a dental issue, here's a clinic, here's the community college that does procedures, here's dentists that are taking new patients. If they need a primary care physician, let's get you assigned. Here's a list of those that are accepting new patients. If it is substance use treatment, here's where we can send you to or refer you to for help. All of those we embedded into the emergency department. Does that mean everybody does what they're referred to? Absolutely not. We know that. But at least they had the opportunity. At least they had the information of where they could go so that, you know what, a week later or two weeks later when they present in the emergency department, wait a minute, two weeks ago I gave you an appointment at the dental clinic. Why didn't you go? You know, if you're there for the right reasons in the emergency department, the care is excellent and it's followed through with. If you're there for the wrong reasons, it should be a little difficult. It should be made that, no, you need to go someplace else. You need to be referred someplace else and, and work that. Parts of the other policy was prescribing policy, high utilizers for chronic pain because emergency departments are not geared to treat chronic pain. It's acute. They're not going to get a narcotic medication. They'll be giving an alternative and a referral where they need to go. No more refills for controlled substances out of the emergency department whatsoever. Don't come in here with a police report. Don't come in here and say the dog ate it, fell in the toilet, lost it. You have to go back to your primary care physician. And if it is warranted, you must use the PDMP to determine their practice with their prescriptions in their history or what they may be currently on or what they have been on. And no more 30 days out of the emergency department, 10 to 12 tablets, 3 to 5 days of medication to get you to where you go for your continuum of care. If you're there for the right reasons, that works. If you're there for the wrong reasons and you're looking for that 30-day supply, guess what? You're not coming back. You know, because you're there for the wrong reasons. How was this emphasized to us? Six months into us, the hospital called us and said, we're not happy with this. Our complaints are way up. Not good when you're talking about press Ganey scores, okay? You know, visits are down and complaints are up. Now, economically, that doesn't sound good for especially local rural hospital. Nine months into this, I get a call from the hospital who's 45 minutes to our east and said, what is happening? We are getting a major amount of Wilkes residents in our emergency department. Good for their business, but it was so over the top, they called us. So we said, this is what we're doing. So guess what they did? Same thing. At the end of the year, and this is validated by Carolina's, uh, they manage our hospital. Um, they said, at the end of the year, our visits were down from previous years. But our revenue was higher, and our satisfaction scores were better. Six to nine to 12 months, we brought about change. And we didn't deny anybody care. We just made it more appropriate and safer and ensured you know, what was you know, occurring. So now this is developed into a toolkit. And I can tell you, Novon Health System, Viden Health System, some of the Carolinas hospitals, they're all implementing the same practice so that everybody's doing the same thing. And some of that was driven by they don't want to be the hospital everybody goes to. Okay, Whatever motivates, just do the right thing. That's what we're after. Then we work with law enforcement for diversion control. If 70% of it is diverted among family and friends, how do we do that? Well, let's get rid of what's being diverted, number one. How many drugs are in among our hoarding community? How many is out there? You know, and I can tell you, I've been in many veterans' homes when I open a cabinet and it's just stocked full, you know, because they keep getting what's being sent to them. Uh, and other people and other individuals, oh yeah, my mom died five years ago. I never knew what to do with this. You know, and it's still there. 
You know, that's what we've been dealing with. So the, the take back days that I'm sure that have been happening here in many West Virginia uh, communities of, of collecting old medications, law enforcement's been enabled to do that. It's been uh, promoted by the DEA at the federal level. And now we, have, we can have permanent kiosk boxes where people can dump their old meds in law enforcement agencies. Two months ago, the DEA changed their practice with that and their policies. Pharmacies can now take back controlled substances. Hospitals and clinics within uh, uh, um, an, an in-facility pharmacy can now take back controlled substances. Long-term care facilities can take that patient's medication and get rid of it when they are, you know, become a resident. Actually, narcotic treatment programs can now take back controlled substances. So if somebody's coming in for treatment, well, what'd you do with your stash? Here, dump it in there. And then just incinerate it and get rid of it. That's one practice that works among the community. And then training and teaching that, you know, you can get a lockbox. You can get a pill vial with a combination on it. We've got some, you know, pharmaceutical companies now that will offer that free with their medication. There's just changing what we do and how we do it so that there aren't any adverse events. It isn't accidentally ingested or it isn't shared. Those are all things that we're working with with law enforcement and then further training with that and working with pharmacies on forgeries and techniques to get more medication using the PDMPs. But we also worked with our law enforcement locally to give them some help. They needed a dedicated officer to address this issue. They didn't have it in their budget. We got them help to get them a grant. After one year, it worked so well, the county commissioners finally said, OK, we'll fund this. There's money somewhere always. It's just how it's being utilized and spent. So training, collaboration. But then we also, with the behavioral health, we now have law enforcement sitting down once a month with our behavioral health folks, our substance use treatment folks, our emergency department folks, our prevention folks, Project Lazarus, our health department, and folks from the court system looking at all the crises, looking at all the things that happened over the past 30 days to see how as a community, how could we do it better? How could we respond to that crisis better so that that person isn't having a crisis every single month? What do we do with the involuntary commitment problems that we have in our community where people who are in danger to themselves or others and there's no place to send them? Is there something we can do locally? All of those factors, by bringing everybody to the table, we have reduced that. We are better at that. Because trust me, law enforcement does not want to keep arresting the same person over and over again for the same issue. They want to get the diverter who's turned it into a business, but the person who has the substance use disorder addiction issue, they want to get them help. But that's not what they do, but if they know who does and they have that relationship, we can start the handoffs. We can start that process. And the, the first um, category I told you about was patients misusing medication. Well, we started support groups with our patients. We're doing this through our Medicaid system with our case managers. They're looking at those who are chronic pain and on opioid medications and bringing them into case management to look at their whole life holistically and otherwise to determine how can we keep you safe? What can we do to better your pain situation? And again, storing your meds, taking them correctly, but looking at health and wellness, looking at your acupuncture, looking at yoga, looking at exercise, working with the wise to determine, can you develop an exercise program for people in pain? To encourage them to come together and have these programs because it's going to enhance their life. Because chronic pain, if I was in chronic pain today and I woke up this morning and looked out the window, what's the last thing I wanna do? Get up and go out. I'd rather just stay in bed or on the couch. All right, those are factors that are counterproductive to the care, but if we can help with support, maybe we can change some of those things. And then I learned about harm reduction. I, didn't, I had never even heard of harm reduction before. Didn't know, even know what it meant for the most part. And then I learned about Narcan naloxone. It's the antidote to an opioid overdose, whether it's an opioid uh, medicine or an opiate like heroin, it will reverse that overdose. So me and my logical, simple-minded thinking, I thought, well, okay, who's got it? If it's available, who has it? Well, as I learned, emergency department and EMS, they've got it. Well, I said, that's fantastic, glad they do. People in my county never made it that far. It takes an hour from one end of the county to the other in our county. No EMS, unless they're already there, are going to get there within minutes. It's not going to happen. And it's never going to happen. So my question was, why can't people have this who need it? So in my logical thinking, and not even paying attention to bureaucracies and who's who, I called the president of our medical board. 
And I asked her that question. I said, I learned about this medication. It's prescribable. Why can't people have this in their homes? And she said, good question. And so we had a public hearing to answer that question. They had us come in, and we met with their policy board and had a, a very formal public hearing with lawyers and everything else. We didn't have one. Uh, but we went and we presented our case. And they said, you have 30 minutes to talk about this. Well, they cut us off at 45. I can talk a lot. Um, and they said, wait a minute. When you first came in here, we already had determined we're against this program of providing naloxone to individuals. But they said, you have shown us that all five of us who prescribe daily have people in our practices that today are at risk for an overdose. And they are the first medical board in the country to come out with a positive position statement saying providing the Loxone, education on overdose and the risks and the benefits, and providing the Loxone is best practice. That really opened up the entire nation to what our goal was, make things like this as best practice and common in everyday life. Like an EpiPen, like your, your glucagon, like your syrup of Epicac, or whatever is necessary because of an adverse event. And as we learned about this, then we created, well, how do people get it? You know, how do prescribers even know how to prescribe it? How do you educate? All of those questions and gaps that we were finding, and we did develop a kit so that it could be done. And we developed and looked at different ways that it's available. And one of the most common ways initially was draw and inject. Now, for heroin users, this is a no-brainer. It's not a problem. For a mom in Wilkes County who has Johnny with an issue, I, you know, I'd look at this and it's scary if they've never injected anybody. You know, and I can give them training and I can have an orange and show them how to do it, but when somebody's overdosing and they're trying to pull this together, not necessarily best practice. So I learned that there is another one that's a pre-filled syringe. Thankfully, Medicaid covers this in, in North Carolina and it is simply screwing it together. And this is approved by the FDA, as is the nasal atomizer. It's approved by the FDA. But put them together, and it's not approved. It's an off-label, aftermarket use of a prescribed medication. Totally allowable. But I can't order and prescribe this with this. They have to be done separately. So again, it's cumbersome on how to do this. So we created a kit so that the kit has this. It has education. It has a booklet in English and Spanish. It has pictures on how to. And then prescribe this, put it in the box, and then everybody's got two doses of an antidote for somebody who may have an adverse event and an overdose. And again, it isn't just somebody who has an addiction and substance use disorder issue. You saw the five categories. We're talking about individuals who are on opiate medication and they have emphysema, or they have sleep apnea, or they have COPD, or they have renal issues, or they're on methadone for the first time for pain, or they're entering into a methadone or buprenorphine clinic for the first time or they're coming out of prison or jail and their tolerance from what they used to take is totally gone and yet the first day out they probably want to go right back to it. Which means they immediately are probably going to overdose and in North Carolina for somebody who's being released from prison or jail is 12% more likely to overdose than anybody else in the community. Because they don't know that information. And then there's the new one that the FDA approved and it's called FZO and it's an, uh, like an EpiPen kind of an auto injector and the FDA approved this in the spring in 15 weeks. Their fourth stage test was not supposed to be done until June of this past year, and suddenly they got the call in March saying FDA's approving. Which, I mean, the, the drug's approved, it was just the method that it was done, but this one's not so bad because it talks to you. This trainer contains no needle or drug. It's a trainer. Place black end against outer thigh. Then press firmly and hold in place for five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. Injection complete. Life saved. That simple. Okay. So for mom who's got chronic pain issues and she's got emphysema because she smoked for years and needs the opioids, here you go. You know, just be aware that there's risks and benefits to your medication. We want to make sure that you're safe. Your biological factors could change at any time. You could be on your medication, doing it correctly. You already have emphysema, and suddenly you get the flu and the bronchitis, and you're breathing suppressed, and you're on an antibiotic. Your metabolism is slowed down. 
So what medicine worked yesterday is now got you at risk today because of what changed. Those are factors that are causing overdoses in our houses today. So we have to address all of them, and we say naloxone, just get it out there. Just prescribe it. Make sure that it's in the environment that it needs to be in, and that's with everybody. I've had a brother save a sister's life. I've had a friend save a friend. I had a mom save her two-year-old child because naloxone was in the house. The child accidentally ingested, and she got it out, and she sprayed it in her daughter's nose and saved her daughter's life. It doesn't get any better than that. And it's not going to enable them to press the envelope and use more because you know what? If you're a regular user, this is the last thing you want. But if you're an overdose, it's the first thing you want. Because one, it takes your high completely away, so you're not happy. All right, you're in withdrawal or you're in pain. It wears off in 30 to 90 minutes, which is why we give two doses to make sure that if they don't get help and don't call 911 and they slip back to overdose, you know, the, the antidote, you know, is available. So we're talking about rescuing and saving. It's not, we can't predetermine or prejudge, oh, you shouldn't have that because of your behavior. No, we got to get over that. You know, and I use that example. If somebody was standing on the side of a bridge today ready to jump off, I'm not going to analyze why they're there. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that they don't jump. Then we can start to deal with the issues that maybe brought it there. So we came up with risk factors and published those that our prescribers use, the medical board put in their publications, suspected history of abuse, higher doses, smoking, COPD, concurrent with a benzodiazepine or other sedative, sedative prescription, voluntary request, patients who may have difficulty assessing emergency services like in our entire county. Um, all of those are factors. Now we passed a law last year in, in North Carolina that we can now have third party prescribing so that if mom is home and Johnny's got the issue, we can prescribe to mom to make sure she's got naloxone. And Johnny might not even know about it. We also have it where it's standing order so that law enforcement first responders can carry it. We now have a law in North Carolina that our, our nurse practitioners in our health departments, based on their determination, they can write the script and dispense it based on a standing order. We want to make sure it gets to whomever it needs to be gotten to. Now, your law did not pass last year. We're going to try again, okay? Um, so there is an effort to not necessarily reintroduce the old bill, but write it and get it done so that you would have standing orders, so that you would have it available, so that you could do third-party prescribing. You know, all of those factors to get it out there, along with the Good Samaritan part of the bill. Good Samaritan so that the individual, I'm, hey, my, my friend stopped breathing, I think he's overdosing. If you know that you're going to make that phone call and law enforcement's going to come into that home and arrest you because of what's there, you're not going to, you're going to run the other way. Same with alcohol and binge drinking and underage drinking. They do the same thing. I'm not calling. Somebody's going into alcohol coma and, and overdose. I got to get out of here so I don't get dinged for underage drinking. Well, Good Samaritan takes care of all that, that no, we won't arrest you for that. And I think there's now like 19 states that have introduced that and more. So all of these are factors that we've learned over time that if we do this, then we have to do this. Oh, then now we have to do this because everything's tied together. Uh, and that's why we take the public health approach, because it helps answer those questions. If I just looked at this as a clinical piece, we're not going to touch everything. If I just look at this as a law enforcement piece, we're not going to touch everything. So we need public health. We need the researchers. We need the operators. We need the doers. We need the users. We need the prescribers. We need everybody in order to bring about the change. So SAMHSA, as you mentioned, I helped that, with that committee to um, for the Substance Abuse Mental Health Services Administration published a toolkit that now promotes the use of co-prescribing and making available naloxone. The U.S. Department of Justice just last month put out their own toolkit for law enforcement, encouraging them that every law enforcement agency in the United States should be carrying naloxone. Quincy, Massachusetts was the first pilot, and they've been at about three years now. 300 lives saved. Lorain County, Ohio, nine lives in their first month because officers had naloxone. You can't have a second chance if you're dead. It's not, our question, it's not our job to ask why, it's our job to save and then work on the whys and the wherefores. And that, that, that Pennsylvania uh, just passed their law too. Michigan just passed their law. Um, some more states are picking this up every year and hopefully yours will too and your support would definitely you know, help with that. Medical Board approved, AMA approved, National Association of Drug Diversion Investigators, SAMHSA, Office of National Drug Control Policy, the American Society of Addiction Medicine, 
the, um, the American College of uh, Emergency Physicians just put out three resolutions positively on the use of naloxone and making it available. So, same community, public health approach. Naloxone, make sure your village knows about it. Make sure everybody is aware of it and what it is and what it can do and make sure that it's available. So now I have school nurses that want it in the schools. Now I have universities that they want their RAs in the dorms to have it because we have had students die overdose in our dorms in North Carolina. And if the rescue medication is there, at least they're on hand and it can be utilized. And guess what, in North Carolina, no liability. The prescriber, the carrier, the administrator, the receiver, no liability on anything regarding naloxone and its use. It takes care of all the obstacles you know, that are there. So addiction treatment, or lack thereof, in everywhere in the United States. We had to address this in Wilkes County. The first clinical medic, medical, uh, the, the, the CME that I did for the prescribers at Wilkes Regional Medical Center, one of my questions was, if you find a patient in your patient population that has an issue with substance use, addiction, whatever it may be, do you know who to call in order to refer them to? Not one hand went up. And I'm like, okay, we got a problem here. Now part of that reason was, there's nothing there. There was no place other than we have a behavioral health organization that you can call and maybe, you know, well, if somebody's in addiction problems and they're in withdrawal and they decide they want help today, an appointment three weeks down the road is not going to help at all. So we looked at what is accepted, that's acceptance, my spelling error, availability, accessibility, and how to bring that about. But one of the first things we have to tackle is the stigma around substance use disorder and addiction. Why is it that the person who is overweight, diabetic, eating 12 Krispy Kreme donuts a day gets all the treatment in the world that they want without any problems? Oh, they might get talked to, but you're still going to get your medication. You're still going to see the doctor. Yet, oh, wait a minute, you've been using prescription medications, you know, that you shouldn't have been, or you've been using heroin, and we treat them entirely differently. It is now a disease model, folks, you know, when somebody's hooked, it is disease, and we have to do all the things appropriate in order to reverse that. And there isn't any one treatment that works for everybody, but there is the kinds of treatment that are out there that can work for everybody. So we can't eliminate just based on our preference. We have to make it available to whoever needs the type that it is, whether it's abstinence only, whether it's support, whether it's medication-assisted treatment. All of those factors need to be you know, within our communities because not everybody's affected by opioids. We know that. I can't stand it. Others get wonderful things from it. So as we look at that, we have to determine, OK, it's the individual again. Again, we always have to bring this back to the person. When we're talking about public health, we're talking about people. Without them, there wouldn't be public health, OK? So we obviously want to do the best we can for those people. So the same thing works in what we're doing with addiction is the support mechanisms, changing the village perception and support, and developing all the support networks all through the community. That the hospital knows what to do, that the human service organizations know what to do, that the schools know what to do, that the faith community knows what to do, and everybody's aware of what addiction is. That somebody who has been on opioids for a long term, their brain is flipped around, okay? Their dopamine levels, everything else is wrong. It's skewed, and the drugs have taken over that, and they're not just going to get up and walk away from it. The same way they didn't just get up and decide one day that I'm going to go out and get addicted today. Does anybody know anybody that can make that confession? I ask this question everywhere, and I haven't found a person yet that actually can admit that, yeah, I woke up Monday, and I decided that week I was going to go out and get addicted. Nobody chooses it, but it happens every day. We can't predetermine why, but we can treat and then deal with those issues as to why that goes. So those are some of the things we're building in the community too. And again, the same village approach. Substance use disorder, make sure everybody's aware of what it is and the reality of it and what it takes to move into recovery, to move into treatment and be successful with it. So what has happened in our lovely Wilkes County that looks much like you know, the rest of your community? Um, <coughs> Wilkes County results not showing up well, but 69% drop from 2009 to 2011. You've been number one for a while. In 2007, we were number three in Wilkes County for overdose deaths in the country. 
and the top two were in New Mexico, was not even in West Virginia. All right, now we sort of aren't even on the radar. You know, we're pretty much, you know, I, I mean, one death is too much, but in statistics wise, we're, we're more into the normal range. But some of the things that we've learned, because again, we're not just talking about numbers. We looked at this in 2008. Okay, who died from prescription medications? Where did they get that prescription? In 2008, 75% of the individuals who died received a prescription within 30 days of their death. And they showed up in the tox screen as contributable to their overdose. Now, most overdoses are more than one drug, so understand that. But as we looked at that 75%, where did their scripts come from? 82% came from a Wilkes County prescriber. By 2011, that is zero, and it's still zero. There is not one script from one doctor anywhere in Wilkes County that is attributable to an overdose since 2011 to today. But we're not denying anybody care. People are still receiving their medication. So what's changed in that realm? Our substance abuse visits done to the emergency department are down. Our diversion tips to law enforcement have hugely increased. The last two years in the state of North Carolina, the number one county for methamphetamine busts for meth labs, one pot method, is Wilkes County, North Carolina. The first reaction out of Raleigh was a laugh, and there's Wilkes County again. I get annoyed at that, so I go back and I say, okay, what's going on here? I meet with the sheriff, I meet with the police departments. What's happening here? Do we have more labs than anybody else? Do we have that many people using it? And their answer to me was no. But we are getting so many tips as to where it's going on and we're responding that we are able to find it and do it and get rid of it. Now we're a moonshine county. It's always been a we and them mentality. You did not tell on somebody else. That is a shift in the public in Wilkes County to do that. We had a, from March to June of, last year, of this year, we had a major sting operation undercover with law enforcement, two agencies, and the State Bureau of Investigation looking at pill diversion in Wilkes County. They arrested 100 people. And as they arrested 100 people, our sheriff said two things quoted in the newspaper. 95% of the arrests came about because the public called us and told us. And then we knew where to go and what to do. Then they said we looked at the prescriptions through that diversion and everything that was being supplied, not one prescription came from Wilkes County. They obtained it somewhere else and brought it back. So we can do all the right things, but if everybody's not doing it, we still end up with the issue and the problem. The sad thing was between March and June, I saw a spike in the overdoses in Wilkes. Why? Because there was a spike in the change of supply, which means people start to scramble and find and do whatever they can, and it puts them more at risk. Those are other dynamics that we, we have to deal with. The narcotic substance abuse treatment, as I said, five, six years ago, we didn't have anything. I mentioned methadone in the county. I thought they were going to rail me out. It was a bad word. We don't do that here, not in our neighborhood, not a drug for a drug, all of those issues. We were able to vet a place, bring them in as a satellite to start a buprenorphine clinic. That was introduced. We educated on methadone, and within two years now we have a methadone and buprenorphine clinic that is very much community activated. They do group counseling, they do individual counseling, they do referrals, they titrate off, they do everything that we would expect a treatment facility to do. And they're connected and working with everybody within the community. They now have, in our little old community that five years ago had nothing, over 500 people on methadone or buprenorphine within our community. That's huge for our population. I have multiple families of three generations in treatment at the same time. That's a grandparent, a parent, and a child all in treatment at the same time. That's huge for our county, but it was necessary. But I still have other communities that you mentioned that word and it's like no way, no how. And trust me, people in our counties who have to go three counties over for daily treatment, it's not gonna happen. So those are things that we need to look at but now, all of a sudden, some of the churches came to us and said, how can we support those folks that are getting treatment? We now have churches paying for their church members to receive methadone and buprenorphine treatment, that they are supplementing financially what is necessary to have them in treatment. Do you understand, Wilkes County, we're a conservative Bible Belt, you know. It was like, and I'm a chaplain, so I talk to pastors frequently. I said, I know you just want to get them saved and get them in the pew, okay? That's not a bad thing, but you know what? It's not going to cure the addiction all the way through. Okay, 
So they have seen the change. They've seen what treatment will do, and now they want to become part of it. And then, of course, our Wilkes County schools in 2011 and 12, we get a 7.4 um, incidences per 1,000 students. 2012 to 2013, 4.9 and 2013 to 2014, 3.4. All of those things are dropping. All of those things are changing, and it, we're, we're thankful for that. To, in March of this year, we had the local methadone clinic helps reduce RX deaths. That was on the front page of the newspaper. Six years ago, they were going to throw me out of town because I just mentioned the word. That is a shift that's going on. Yet, our prescribing levels do not have to change. We are still running around that 8% mark. Dosages probably have gone down. I have not looked at those. But people can still get care. They can still be prescribed. They can be, still be taken care of. But you know what? They take it correctly, store it securely, dispose of it properly, and they're not sharing it. In the past three years, based on medical examiner reports, we have not had one patient make a mistake and die. In the past three years, we've only had one person who was a family member that shared and took another family member's medication, and unfortunately, it killed them. That's one. All the rest have the history of some sort of substance use, and they're getting it from outside the county and bringing it back. Hardest population to reach, we know that, but they can be reached and, and worked with. Whoops. Counties with coalitions that we've learned quickly, the coalitions with the health department was the lead agency, had a statistically significant 23% lower rate of emergency department visits for substance use issues. Embedded in the community, by the community, for the community, by community members, it makes a difference. We can't come in from the outside and do it, but it can be done from the inside. And if we invest in leadership, we have a 2.7 uh, increase in the odds of, of success in getting something initiated. We do this through different venues and coalitions at the community level, driving at the community level, creating champions there to do the public health work and engaging and mobilize the community. They have to do it themselves, but they need to be empowered and enabled to do that. And steering committee, everybody is a member of the community. It's not outside, it's inside. And it's going to stay inside that way. So different things that we deliver, you don't need to see that. There's information on our website. Um, uh, that's about to be brand new as soon as I launch it. It's being built, you know, kind of behind the scenes. Um, and, and we're free to answer any questions, you know, folks have and, and help them in any way. And all these toolkits, the community toolkit, prescriber's toolkit, emergency department toolkit, the media information, it's available for anybody. Yes. We, at, at the, when, we, when we drill this down and we're actually presenting and teaching and training in communities, we, we talk about all, all medications, whether it is over-the-counter, whether it is prescribed. It's their behaviors regarding any of that, whether it's the cough syrup and it's dad's cough syrup and Johnny, all the same things. You know, so today I'm just focusing on, on, on the prescription piece. But when we get into the local level, when we have more time, then we, we, we touch on everything. Yes, we, we, we promote the, the one pharmacy and, and we actually promote that, 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 they, that they put together their list of prescriptions that they have all on one piece so that if there is an adverse event and EMS is showing up, they got it right there. You know, all of those things we promote at the local level as behavioral changes, yes. Libraries have educational information in their library to be able to have available for folks, yes. Yeah. But let's not forget why we do this. It's people. All right? There's individuals behind every number that you look at, whether they are a patient, whether they are a user, or whether they're a statistic. And that's what we have to look at and remember that we're talking about people and everybody's different. And here is a young lady who tried to get help, couldn't get it, couldn't afford it, but didn't learn along the way about tolerance or changes or triggers or cravings. Went through cold turkey withdrawal with her mother, got over the opioids as far as detox, um, but other issues there. A friend shows up on a Friday night a short time later, gives her one pill that she used to take and she didn't see Saturday morning. Those are the kind of things we don't have to have happen in our communities. I just encourage you in what you're doing and what you're learning and however your scope of practice is or going to be, that you address this from every individual is different and look at it that way and what is best for them 
in what needs to be done with safety measures and so forth. And thank you for your time, and I, I hope we have time for questions and so forth uh, in order to uh, um, continue the dialogue regarding this. Yes? Yes. I get this without the atomizer for $17.50. That's pretty much at pharmacy cost. It is now $34. All right, they doubled it. This used to be $2.67 the first time I bought it. I'm still getting it for over $3, but the actual price is over $5. Um, so we have had price increases in the Loxone. There's only one manufacturer in the States, Hospira. Uh, and now there's only these three devices that we have. There is a fourth that's in the FDA pipeline, and we'll find out next year if that will be approved, and that's another atomizer that's a single unit device. So we'll see where, where that goes. So there's prices all over the place. It, from a prescribing level like FZO, if you have insurance, a copay is nothing, and it's good for two years. And, and that's why that device was built that way. You know, for Medicaid to cover CMS and private insurance, you can pay $28 and it's yours, and it's good for two years, okay? This, again, is gonna cost you, you know, 40 bucks, you know, or thereabouts now, you know? And you want two doses, so there's 80 right there, and you still don't get any education pieces or, or, or whatever with that. Um, so with, it, with naloxone, we're not where we need to be. Um, there's, there's talk of over-the-counter. Uh, I guarantee you we will get there someday. I don't want it today. Now, my harm reduction friends and so forth on the street, yeah, they want it today, and I, and I totally agree with that. But until the medical community is common, until this is every day and people understand it, then we can talk about over-the-counter, in my opinion. Yeah. So pricing is, is an issue. Um, we as a program and as a nonprofit, somebody calls us and said, I need a kit. Do you have a doctor? Yeah. Can they write a script? Yeah. Okay, here's the kit. You know, oh, I don't have a doctor. I can't get it. We find a way to get it. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. In West Virginia? Yes. Because I can tell you the auto injector is three hundred forty five dollars. Right. None of the pharmacies carry it. Right. Uh, so you need realistically you need two auto injectors at seven hundred dollars. Yeah, every kit comes well it's it's I think it's if it was over the counter, it's like three hundred. That includes two doses. That's the entire kit. You know, uh, from what I've seen of this, you know, it comes with two doses and this trainer in, in their box. Yes. Yeah. I tried two months ago. Medicaid did not cover it. Medicaid does not cover it in, in West Virginia right now. Well, no. There's a lot of different levels of confusing. But right. I couldn't get it. It's not on their formulary. Yeah. I asked. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Here. But right. that, that kit you have, I can't. Yeah. Care. Yes. It's doable, and that's something we can. Yes, because naloxone has been prescribable for years, so anybody could have been prescribing this all the way along. Pharmacies, do they carry this? For the most part, no. But can they? Yes. So we sort of drive that at the local level with coalitions. Get your pharmacies, or at least one, to carry this so that your prescribing community knows, okay, I'm writing you this. They have naloxone. It's in stock. This is where you go to pick it up. Now, in Massachusetts and California, they now have started to cover the atomizer. There's no NDC code for this, so it's not something that is prescribable. Um, but I'm told by Teleflex, who makes this, that they're going after that NDC code so that it could be. Um, so you pretty much have to work with the pharmacy and work with how can you make it available, but yes, you can. And it's not illegal to do that because it's prescribable. Um, Veterans Administration, this is on their primary formulary now, and in the D Department of Defense, among our active duty soldiers on base, this is now available on their formulary uh, as well as this is. We've, we've worked to get any, any, you know, I don't tell people what to use, just to have it in whatever format works for them. I, if I could show you North Carolina slides for every county of where heroin has been an issue and the progression of that. And there has been a progression. We went down for five years. In the past two years, we have gone up. Uh, when we look at the counties with the higher prescribing, you do see more deaths of heroin within that area, except for the far west. There's only like three counties that show up, and all the rest haven't shown any. 
So, and they're the, the highest prescribing area in the state. So it doesn't tra it, that transition doesn't happen everywhere. And most of it, from what we've seen, starts in the urban area and then sort of spreads out um, with, with the heroin that's going on today. So there, there, is, there is documented transition from opioids to heroin. Not everybody, um, but there is. Um, cartels have sold prescription medications on the street in order to get them hooked to where they can't afford it anymore, and then here's heroin. Um, all of those are factors, plus the, the stigma surrounding heroin, you know, it used to be, ugh, you know, that was kind of the attitude. Now it's become more acceptable in circles, especially among young people, to have it around and snort it, whatever, you know, just not quite like marijuana, but it, it's, it's gained some popularity that's been accepted that's very hard to reverse. Uh, so we, we look at that correlation frequently in, in those individual counties. Um, we only had one death in Wilkes in 10 years that heroin was attributable, but it was the second attribution, not the primary. So, you know, for us, it hasn't become an issue. Yes? I imagine you have a lot of people in Wilkes County who have a medical insurance, especially with these cases. Right? Yes. And your methadone clinic will take care of them on a sliding scale? They, they, to a certain extent, they have. Um, for um, women who are pregnant and have addiction issues, they take them no charge. Um, they do not accept Medicaid, but I'm told 2015 they will begin that process uh, to do that. Um, pretty much it is a cash-only basis, so it doesn't meet everybody's need, unfortunately. Um, we're, we're, we talk with them frequently on how can we help, how can we support in order to do that. And they have worked with us on, on many case-by-case -case basis in order to do that but they are a corporate entity, so they don't have the entire freedom that when we first, and, and I have to say, we vetted them. In other words, we interviewed them. We wanted to know who was coming into our town. You know, not that we could stop anybody, but we could certainly help promote and so forth. And they, they at the time, and they still are, uh, they were advocates. They did everything above and beyond. They since sold out to a corporate entity, um, but at least they have kept those same practices but I think that, that part about case by case is going to become much more difficult. But at least they're going to pick up Medicaid because this is covered, number one. But we've been doing a pilot for quite some time with them. We provide a kit in the lock zone. They, as, as an entity, pay for half of that with no charge to the patient. And then we, through our grants, pay for the other half and ensure that every new enrollee gets in the lock zone kit because our state would like every opiate treatment program to provide naloxone to every new enrollee, no matter where they are in the state. So we're trying to get there. On a large scale, no. Um, and, and I'd have to say, one, I was known in the community, so that helped a great deal. Um, I was naive in many ways, you know, so I, I, I don't look at territories, you know, I just go and ask and do. Um, I didn't know what harm reduction was. Uh, my county wouldn't know what harm reduction was, you know, so, and the lock zone, if I just went in with this, I probably would have gotten pushback. But when I brought it in with everything, it was no problem. Now, pushback is kind of individual group by individual group. We have some law enforcement agencies that said, yes, we want that and others are going like this. And then we have other EMSs that are saying, that's our job, you know, not yours. Um, we have prescribers that say, I won't do that. You know, we have some prescribers that said, how can I do this? So, you know, that, that's why we, it's got to be done at the local level. I can have the AMA say, yes, go do this, and that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Yes. I've had frequent conversations in Washington on that uh, with SAMHSA and ONDCP and others. And what, what he's asking about is buprenorphine, which is, comes in, in, in Suboxone, Subutex, and Subsolve. And that's a treatment for addiction. Um, and a, a provider has to go through eight hours of training, take an exam, and be certified. They get an X next to their DEA. And when they obtain that, they can take 30 patients at any one time in order to treat. 
After their first year, then they can apply to do 100 patients. Then that is their ceiling. They can only ever have 100 patients at a time. Um, we would like them to be able to take more than that. Now, part of that problem is we now have doctor groups who say, okay, Subutex, Suboxone, it becomes a very cash-oriented, money-making process. And the regulations for buprenorphine is you can write a script for 30 days, you must see them every 30 days, have a face-to-face -face for at least 5, 10, 15 minutes, and that's it. That's all that's required. Um, Subutex, you know, can be given out like methadone on, on a daily dosing. Um, we would like some more stringent intervention, you know, so that it isn't just supplying the, the drug, it's supplying the support network, uh, and the community has to be engaged in some of that. So, yes, if I can give somebody 200 patients, for the ones that do everything well, that's fantastic. For those that are just pretty much dispensing, then we have more problems and more possible diversion, uh, if that's kind of where you were going with that, with that question. So, Uh, well, I mean, like, like any, any prescriber, you know, you, you, can, you can pretty much eventually pick out the bad one from the good one based on what they're doing. Um, if, if, if the prescriber on Suboxone or Buprenorphine is doing everything right, they're documenting, doing the minimum of what needs to be done, there's nothing you can do because they are doing what is required. Um, and, and that's why we, we look at, okay, what is being required, what could be required, and make changes with that without causing problems to where then nobody wants to do it. Because if I, it, you know, in rural, what we work on with our coalitions in our rural communities is to get the local prescriber to be certified in buprenorphine. Deal with that issue with the patients that you're already serving. We don't, you don't need to open a clinic. You don't need to necessarily see 30 patients, but you know, you could have 10 in your practice right now that could benefit from this service. So get your certification and service them because be the medical home that you really want to be. Now that takes some face-to-face, -face, that takes some education and some convincing, but we're gaining ground in that realm because many rural communities aren't going to have a clinic. They're not going to have a methadone clinic. It's just not economically viable. So, the, you know, the, there's, there's always different dynamics in that conversation, uh, but those conversations are going on at, at the federal level to see if some of those things can be changed. Okay, perfect. Thank you all. I appreciate your attention. <laughs>